Hello and welcome to Scripting for Artists. My name is Sibirin and this episode is called Roast My Add-on. I've asked on social media for your add-ons for me to roast so that we can go through it and see what is bad, what is good, and how things can be improved. We look at a few different add-ons and in the end of this episode, I will extract some general hints and tips for you to use in your own code. On Twitter, Tonton says, Hey, thanks, that's a great idea. I would be glad to have some pros insight about my coding. This first add-on is a project manager for Anim Workflow, and the other add-on is a simple tool to reload images in the blend file. Feel free to pick one if you have some time. Cheers. I will pick the second one first, because that looks like something simple and nice to start with. So let's take a look at the code. Here we are on GitHub, and the first thing I notice is that it has a description, which is good. Handy automatic reload for image textures. Then there is a bunch of files, and there's a readme that says it's a Blender 2.80 add-on, so it's compatible with the more modern Blender versions. I'm assuming that it will also run on newer than 2.80. It can refresh all the images of the blend file. It can use a timer to fetch modified image file and reload them if needed. That is pretty handy, and already I want to use it. It has a link to download, and it has a little demo video. If you want to watch the video, I've put the link down below in the description, so you can just click it there. I'm looking at all the files that are there, and I wouldn't exactly know what to expect where. Uh, there's developer utils, there's functions, um, there is dev. I don't know how dev differs from developer functions. And then there is misc, probably short for miscellaneous. So where would some function go? Would it be miscellaneous? Would it be dev? Would it be developer utils? Would it be functions? So I try to always avoid naming things uh, utils or helpers or miscellaneous. Generally, that's an indication that it's just a bag of stuff that is going to expand over time. And that is not something you want in your source code. Now let's take a look at the init file. 90 lines in a file and 71 source lines of code. It's a rather small file, which can be pretty nice. So it gives a nice overview. It starts with copyright information, GPL license, of course, BL info is all given. It even shows where you can find the settings for this add-on. It has a wiki URL, it has a tracker URL, import BPI, so far so good. Now it imports import lib and inspect from period it import developer utils, which means from the current module import the submodule called developer utils, and then it tries to reload that. This works, but generally the reloading scheme is a little bit different from multi-file modules, but if this works for you, that's fine. Then we have modules is developer utils, setup add-on modules, path name, bpy in locals. Okay, so magic is going on there, and then classes and is an empty list, and then so this is basically, I'm guessing, a collecting all the Python classes that need to be registered and unregistered from the submodules. Uh, usually I wouldn't do it in this way. I would give every submodule its own register and unregister function and just call that from the top level function. That way there's no magic. It's all pretty clear where things are called from. Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of this kind of magic. And then there is from dot functions import reload startup. So from the submodule functions, it imports the reload startup thing. I think it's a function. Um, okay. Then for the register, some properties are added, which are all fine. And then for CLS in classes, call the register class. Yes. So this uses this classes list that you define here and then registers everything. All right, and then the reload startup is added as a post load handler. The Dell CLS here is really not necessary because the only thing that does in Python is it removes the CLS name. But then on the next iteration, CLS gets the next class assigned to it anyway, so then it exists again. This is not like C++ where it would delete the actual object in memory. It just removes the name from the current namespace so you can no longer use it. Because of all the magic, I still don't know what is defined where. So let's go and look at a different file. Let's take a look at operators and see what kind of operators there are. Lots of stuff being imported, more stuff from the... Oh, if you have to import so many names from that module, I would rather just import the module itself, like from dot import functions, and then call functions.updateViewer or functions.getMyDare. That way it's easier to see again where things are coming from. This should be the core of the code. 
oh, and please just no, don't no, don't do this. Like indent your code. Python is based on indenting. And if you write it like this, it's so hard to see what's going on. Um, so if length of modified list doesn't equal zero, so that means if there's stuff in there, uh, Python automatically can convert things to Boolean for you. So the so list, if it's empty, is considered false. And if it's not empty, it's considered true. So this means that you can say if modified list instead of if len modified list doesn't equal zero. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's see. WM is context window manager. OK, fair enough. It's not used here. It's not used here. So that could be a few lines lower. Um, then modified list and missing list is reload modified images. So I'm guessing that reloads all the modified images, like the images that were modified on disk. So it's nice to have that in a separate function. That's good. So then if there is images modified, we update the viewers, which is also nice. It also passes the context. That's also nice. Um, I'm not sure why there is no context here. Maybe it's not necessary. Maybe it uses the global context. I don't know. There's a style conflict here. So here you're using camel case. Here you're using underscores. Um, pick one and stick to it. And I would say pick the Python style that's documented in pep8, which means use the underscores here for functions. Then if there's no missing images, auto reload missing images is set to false. Otherwise, auto reload missing images is set to true. Well, you can just rewrite this, right? Here I have the same file in my code editor, so I can show you what I mean. First, I'll re-indent it. This is already a little bit nicer. Now, if we compare that, what happens to the f above that? We can see that if len modifier list is not zero, then we do something. So first, we check for whether that list has elements, and then we have a very similarly looking if statement that checks for whether it's empty, and this will cost you brain power. So I would say. If modified list, that's it. If modified list, update viewers context. If there's anything in there, update your viewers. And this is way simpler. And we can do something similar to this as well, but this checks whether it's empty. So if it's empty, it does this. If it's not empty, it does this. So this checks whether it's empty, which you can just write as this. If not missing list, then set something to false, else set something to true. I don't quite like the if not in combination with the else. If you're going to handle both the true and the false cases anyway, then you might as well get rid of the negation by swapping what is in the if and what's in the else. So I move the equals false down, I move the equals true up, and I remove the not here. And now what you have is two consecutive checks that do the same thing. If modified list, do something. If missing list, do something, else do the opposite. The cool thing about improvements like this is that they really help the readability of your code. And I actually do this a lot. Once I've written the code, I will go back in and see, okay, now that it is working, can I improve it? Can I clarify what's going on? If you want, we can take this one step further because basically what this is saying is auto reload missing images when there are missing images. So we can write that as an expression. This does exactly the same thing. If missing list is considered true, bool missing list is true and assigns true to auto reload missing images. And the same for when the list is empty, it assigns it false. So this line expresses what you actually want. Auto reload missing images when there are missing images. The rest of the code just seems to be for debugging. And here you can also see the issue with the imports. If you import if you do from dot global variables import sign comma reloaded now here you all of a sudden have sign and reloaded and missing and it's hard to see where that comes from let's continue with the add-on the next function is load font and immediately i see something that i really don't like here you have a try accept block and the accept is just a bare accept, so it will catch anything. This means it will also catch a keyboard interrupt when the user presses Ctrl C to, to break off some hanging operation. It will catch any error, including the ones that you don't want to catch at all. And then this bit of code, the raise exception, it doesn't include anything anymore. So when the original exception would have provided some information as to what is going wrong, maybe the font cannot be loaded, maybe the memory is full, maybe the font is corrupted, maybe something else went wrong. You never know. So just remove it. 
Otherwise, his code is quite simple, so that's all fine. Um, one last thing that I would really like to see is a bit of documentation about what self is in this case, um, because when you just go through the code top to bottom, you have no idea what it is. Let's quickly go through the next operator. This is the actual reloading timer. So because this video has been going on for quite a bit already, I'll go into a quick roast mode. Here we have OS path join of OS path join. That's not necessary. You can just do it like this. I wouldn't mix regular Python properties with Blender properties. Except attribute error, no, just fix your code. Make sure that there is no attribute error. Comparison to false, nope, just do if not. Else after a return, no, I wouldn't do it. You can just do this, which means that you can just flip this condition around and then return pass through and indent this and that we can do again. There is if something is not something else, well, you can just flip it and do that. And now I've already indented the code twice. This code, we've seen it before. No, don't do that. Where the function, put the code there, call it from two different places. The rest of the code pretty much follows the same style, so I won't go through that again. Thank you very much, Tonton, for lending me your code to roast, and let's move on to the next. So the next add-on is by Ocube, and he's very to the point, roast my add-on. So here we go. His code is on GitHub as well, so we can scroll through it. I see a bunch of files, including a readme, which is nice. It has some examples. It shows what it can do. Germans like to call a projector a beamer, same in the Netherlands, actually. Let's take a look at the initpy because that's where it all starts. Import logging, cool, nice. Um, separate imports, that's also good. BL info seems to be complete. No, don't do this. This configures the entire logging module of Python and basically forces every user to have debug logging for everything in a specific format. This is really the, something that you should leave to users or other developers to control on their system. Also, the log here is not used at all, so there's no point in creating it. Nice separate register and unregister functions per module. That's what I like to see. So let's take a look at the operators. Well, there's only one. It sets the uh, render engines with cycles. Let's take a look at the projector itself. I kind of expected an operator that says add new projector to the scene in the same way that we added a monkey grid to the add mesh menu. Again, you call logging.basic.config, which again overrides the configuration that you have just set in a different module. So this is really a weird way of going about things. As I said before, I'm not a fan of modules being called helper, util, miscellaneous, that kind of stuff. But let's take a look at these. Get projectors gets the context and only selected, which defaults to false. But when you look at the references, you only call it with only selectors is true. So why not just name the function get selected projectors and have it over with? Random color, alpha equals false as default. You only use it twice. So why not remove the default and just pass alpha as true and alpha as false? And then you have it explicitly said. What I do like is that you say alpha is true and not just true. This makes it much clearer what is going on in that particular call. So onto the rest of the code, you define some stuff, which is nice, but I'm not here to be nice. Then projector OT change color randomly. First operator that we see, why is this not in the operators module? There's something weird going on because the poll method only allows this operator to be called when the number of selected projectors equals one, but then you select all, but then here you take all the projectors and just loop over them. So if you have more than one selected, it would actually work. Blender being Blender, this is basically the difference between working on the active object of working on the selection. And this code seems to confuse the two. Then we have a function create project textures. You construct an image name from the resolution, which is fine. Then you check whether the image is there. And then you use an operator to actually create the image if it doesn't exist yet. The problem with this approach is that this operator may create an image with a different name than you give it. If an image with that name already exists, it will just append .001. That means that this line may actually access the wrong image. Now, the chances of that happening are pretty much zero because of the line before it, but I would never use this anyway. Here we have the code in my editor so I can show you some changes that I would do. So instead of putting this in the if, I would just say image is this. This get function basically means give me the image with that name. If it doesn't exist, don't throw an error, but just return none. If not image, then create a new image, which you can do like this. This creates the exact same image, except that it gives you a reference to that data block that it just created. So even when that name was unavailable and it chose something else or something completely different happened, you get the actual image data block that you're interested in. And then you can set properties on it. In this, in this case, we have to set the generated type because we can't pass that directly to the new function. And this can then just use 
image.usefake user is true. I think this reads a little bit nicer and also it makes less assumptions about what's going on behind the scenes. The next function is called add projector node tree to spot, which I think is quite a good name because it exactly says what it's doing. It is documented as this function turns a spotlight into a projector. And this is the first time that we'll learn that a projector is actually modeled as a spotlight. This is actually something that I would have expected in readme and not in the middle of some code. So when we scroll down, what I notice is that there is a comparison with the Blender version. I think this is a good idea. The only thing is that the index here on the inputs array, you can also use a string for that. Here in inputs, instead of writing three, you can also write the string scale. The rest of the add-on is boring because the code is well written and it's pretty clear what it's doing. The only comment that I have is that it could use a few more comments. So let's move on to the final add-on that I will be roasting today. Ambi is wondering how long a book are you going to write? Well, Ambi, not as long as your add-on. He made the Blender Texture Tools a Blender add-on for simple image manipulation. And I wish that the source code was as simple as that description. So looking at the files, I already noticed that there is a git submodule in here. Git submodules are a way to combine multiple git repositories into one project. And I think for a Blender add-on, this may actually be overkill. Let's start again at the init.py. Free software. That is very nice. And now we have some import magic. NumPy is a Python library that allows you to do number crunching, and it's good at handling large amounts of data. So I think it's a good choice for this particular add-on because it has to deal with images. But then the rest, there is apparently QPy. It's basically a library that allows you to do the same operations as NumPy, but then in CUDA on your GPU. Again, I think it's a good choice to use here. But the way that it's handled is really weird. CUDA active is set to false or true depending on whether QPy was loaded or not. To me, this code looks like it's trying to use QPy if it exists on the system and it can be loaded and otherwise fall back to NumPy instead. However, that's not how this reads. It's really confusing and in the end, I don't know what is going to be used by the rest of the code. Let me give you an example of how I would do this. So first of all, I'm going to assume that we want to use QPy, unless that's not available, and then we want to use NumPy. But in the end, the code is going to be using either one or the other library. So the try and import QPy is fine, but let's import it as NP. Importing NumPy as NP is really common because that prefix is used a lot in your code and the difference between two and five letters is going to be considerable given the number of invocations that you have on a typical line. So let's just keep using that NP and use QPy as a dropping replacement. So we're going to try to import QPy and if that fails, then we're going to import NumPy. Both will end up as the NP name. So once this is done, we can just say NP.something and it will use whatever was loaded here. This immediately shows the reader what is going on here and what is the intention behind this code. Now I've already looked ahead a little bit and the CUDA active is only used in one place. That place is here in the add-on preferences. It says if CUDA active is false, well, instead of this, we can now just write if NP dot name equals numpy. This avoids the whole keeping track of what was loaded and what was not because Python already does that for us. So QPy is a library that you can install. It doesn't come bundled with Blender. So Ambi made an operator that can download it for us, which is pretty nice. But the way he does it, not so much. From sub process import call, I wouldn't do that because then you have a call name that is just in your namespace there and you get these kind of calls that call a call and it's not immediately obvious that it is actually calling a sub process. So I would always say import sub process and then sub process at call. However, a sub process at call doesn't check any errors. So it could be completely failing and you wouldn't know. So instead of this, use sub process dot run with check equals true as a parameter, then at least it will stop your Python code from running any further when the download or the install fails. In this case, you have a double problem because you already set CUDA active to true before importing QPy. So even when all of this failed, import QPy will fail again, but then you have CUDA active already set to true and then your state is all messed up. Let's browse through the code a bit more. I see a lot of small functions that do something very specific, which is kind of nice, but the naming is a bit strange. Like what is IG? What does the neighbor average do? What does it return? There is no documentation at all about any of the types. There is no type annotations that explain what is returned or what is expected, especially when you're using short variable names here, like O, I, and D. I don't know what's going on. A row zero? What is a row zero? Why is it different from a row one? 
And why is a role zero different from add role zero? Here, if you have a comment that needs to explain what the parameters mean, just name the parameters differently. Instead of SSP, name it source. Instead of intense, name it intensity. So a convolution is an image operation. And here there's a problem because it doesn't tell us whether the source image is changed or whether a new image is returned. This is something that permeates through this code. Also this grayscale function, does it turn the given image into a grayscale image or does it return a grayscale copy of the image? This should be documented well because it really helps you understand what's going on. So having scrolled down about a thousand lines of code, we get to these classes, which are subclasses of image operator generator. And this is starting to turn into a bit of code smell. It has one function called generate, and then it sets certain keys in self.props to blender properties. And it sets the prefix, it sets info and category, and then it has self.payload, which is a lambda function. I won't even go into what a lambda function actually is. I want to know what this image operator generator is. I found it here in a different file, and it's a subclass of operator generator, and it gets somehow a master name, which it passes to init begin, then it says force numpy equals false, calls that generate function that we already saw, then init end, it sets its own name to image ot and then self.name. So it doesn't even, wait, but here you don't have a name at all, so I, I don't even know where this name comes from and then it calls create op which i guess creates the blender operator and then it says self dot op dot first num numpy equals self dot first numpy which was already set to false here <sighs> i found the operator generator inside the git sub module so here we have the init begin and it gets the master name which is then assigned to the parent name so apparently the parent is the master i don't know what that means even um, it says self.payload instead of having a payload function. Um, then it sets a bunch of other things to empty, but not that name that is only set in init end. And there is a create op function that dynamically creates a new class. I think this is clever code, but it's a bit too clever. It is so hard to follow. And especially when you go into Blender and these operators have been registered. And then you want to search for where that operator was created, you will never find it. That naming convention of having category in capitals and then underscore OT underscore and then the rest of the identifier. That is very useful because that is used all over the place. If you have bpy.ops.something.something, you can apply those rules and then you have the class name. So given a name of something in Blender, it's pretty easy to find it in the source code. And with this structure, that name is nowhere. I think the advantage of this code is that it is pretty easy to add new operators. Personally, I would make the code just a little bit larger, type a bit more, but then have everything there where it's supposed to be, easily findable, easily understandable how things are created. Whew, okay, we've made it to the end. I hope you've enjoyed this roasting as much as I have. So as a final thought, name things well so that you don't have to use your brain later on when you're trying to read it. Return early and flip those conditions and see if it makes a difference. So that's it for this episode. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below and I will see you soon.